Mr. Fadden, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Now, I think there will be some people who may be surprised by your comments, given that Canadians are, as you know, very appreciative, very proud when they actually see Canadian forces helping communities in time of need. So why is there this concern about the use of military assets as a response to natural disaster? Let me start by saying that there will always be some circumstances where it's necessary to draw on the military as the resource of last resort. Uh, my uh, The challenge, it seems to me, is the definition of last and last resort. Over the course of the last, I don't know, decade or so, we've seen a in significant increase in the number of natural disasters, or what are euphemistically called disruptive events. And increasingly, the military has been asked to involve itself in dealing with these events. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, unless you start worrying a little bit about the capacity of the Canadian forces to train operationally and to be ready to do what they're supposed to do as a military. Uh, I don't think the Canadian forces uh, today, and for some time now, have had sufficient resources, money and time to train operationally. And if you put this in the context of the evolving geopolitical situation around the world, where it's more likely they'll be asked to go abroad to do things, for example, with NATO and Estonia, they need to be trained. And every time we draw on them uh, to do domestic things, it takes them away from operational training. Secondly, mm -hmm. I think it gives rise to the question of, are we doing enough on the civil side, federally, provincially, municipally, municipally and otherwise, uh, to make sure that there's a balance in who, de who helps when we have these disasters? Okay, Let, uh, we'll pick up on that point in a second, Mr. Fadden, but I want to get back to your first, this idea that uh, having Canadian forces respond for all natural disasters takes them away from training. And that's based on what? The, the number of times the forces have been called in the, the past recent years? I think it's, it's a function of the number of times they've been called upon. It's also, I think, a function of the military having difficulty in recruiting the numbers that they want, that they need. So there are fewer people available to do disaster relief without being pulled away from operational training or from being abroad. It really is a variety of issues which suggests that they should only be used as a, as a resource of last resort. I want to emphasize again, I'm not against, I'm not arguing against their being used. I just think that we should make sure that non-military resources are being used uh, whenever it's possible to use them, and only when it's absolutely necessary do you recor have recourse to the military. Mm -hmm. But and, and you reference it a little bit off top, but if not the members of Canadian forces, who would be used? From a practical stance, is there really uh, any other entity in this country that can be mobilized as quickly and as effectively? Well, I think that gives rise to the question of why are the Canadian forces mobilized? And I think you can put into three large buckets how we use the military in, to deal with disruptive events. The first is logistical, the second is administrative, and the third is simply manpower, simply bodies of the sort that are being used right now in the Maritimes to cut trees and whatnot. In the first bucket, logistical, I think you could probably argue that, you know, using attack helicopters to move bedding across the country is not the best use of those resources. If you have no other option, then you use them for that purpose. But it seems to me that if we did more planning for disasters, if we involved the provinces, the municipalities, and the private sector, we could have standing contracts available that would permit uh, this sort of logistical support to take place or to originate from elsewhere than in D&D. And incidentally, given the cost of using D&D resources, if we do this carefully, we could probably save some money. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge that on the manpower side, if you just need a lot of bodies, D&D is ideal, uh, but not every resource, uh, not every disaster calls for, for manpower of that sort. And in the middle, you know, what I call administrative work, it's registering people for, uh, to receive financial aid. It's registering people to give them uh, places to stay and whatnot. And I think we have to, to look at what we ask the Canadian forces to do in disasters in these three large buckets. And it would vary depending upon the circumstances. Well, and, and let me jump in because we're quickly losing time. But I do have to ask about any kind of international example from which Canada might learn. Because certainly the United States has uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They have FEMA. Is that something that you're talking about in, in terms of replacing what D&D &D currently does? 
what I'm arguing for is a, for the for Canada to have a holistic look at emergency planning and disaster planning. It's something we haven't done for a long time. And I think it's something that we need to do to determine what is the best mechanism. The United States use of FEMA worked very well for them in some circumstances, less well in others. I don't know if that's what we want to do here, but I do think that we could probably increase the collaboration, the cooperation between the level three levels of government, between civil society and between with the private sector. But it's unfair, I think, to give the prime minister in the case of disasters only one option, which is to call in the army. I think we need to think about how we might be able to do this in other ways. For example, uh, you know, the Canadian Red Cross and similar organizations have a vast capacity to mobilize people and resources. Is this fit into the, our disaster planning as much as it possibly could be? I don't know, but I think a public inquiry would help us determine this and possibly plan better for the future. Mr. Fadden, good to speak with you. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure.